the main idea is that uh, not only should economic growth be inclusive, not only should it create opportunity for all, but growth, in fact, is more likely and it's more sustained when it is inclusive. And this is not some romantic idea. The evidence is on our side. The lesson of history is that when you invest broadly in your people, when you have policies uh, for investment, for taxation, for land, um, for small business, for all these things, for competition, that levels the playing field, that creates opportunities, uh, regardless of someone's background, or what region they live in in a country, or whether they live in a city or a small town. When you are intentional about that as a society, it's much more likely you're going to enjoy sustained growth and higher growth over the long haul. As a government, how do you differentiate between being populist mm. and at the same time driving inclusive growth? Mm. That's a great question. On one level, I think you know populism has come to mean whatever will create a, a quick and mass appeal. So populism, in a sense, is about a popularity contest for ideas. And sometimes, as we have learned, sadly, it's also about mobilizing very ugly biases and hatreds and old fears. It has nothing, in fact, to do with good policy or what carries the country forward. Um, so w what I'm talking about, what we together work on with our partners and colleagues around the world is building in inclusion. If anything, it's, you know, it's tearing down walls, it's tearing down barriers. And sometimes it does uh, require that communities and societies take the longer view. They not just focus uh, purely on what's sort of known and popular or generates the most immediate appeal in the moment, but what's going to make sense for the longer haul? Uh, would you want to give us a practical example of where this has been done, if possibly in Nigeria, mm -hmm. and the outcomes, maybe or the expected outcomes? Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, there are a number of examples. If we look around the world, and I'll, I'll try to situate some in the in the region, if I can. I mean. Broadly, we have in history one set of examples, let's say, in Europe, especially after the Second World War. So there, a, a number of steps are taken in areas like housing, in areas like uh, making college affordable for everyone, uh, creating a, a so-called safety net for people who, who fall into spells of unemployment or, or whatnot. Those are just some examples. Um, and we see that these are societies that have managed, they have spells of uh, lower growth, to be sure. All societies, all economies go through that. But over the long haul, they've been able to stay competitive, to stay innovative. You have uh, nations like Germany, of course, they just export machines, in enormously successful, even though they're not huge countries. Um, so, you know, it's, it's being intentional about steps like that, those things. And we do see examples, not only in Nigeria, but in other parts of the developing world. I don't know if you want to talk a little bit about Ford programs in Nigeria and what you've been doing maybe since mm -hmm. Ford Foundation came into the country. Yeah, so I joined the Ford Foundation in January okay. and my job is to uh, get the mission-related investments effort that's impact investing using endowment capital um, uh, to generate social and financial returns. So part of the reason why I'm here, in addition to supporting this event, is to learn what we can do uh, in, in Nigeria. Uh, at this stage, our, we have made uh, three or four investments, three investments, four investments, and one of those investments um, has some focus on uh, the sort of Africa, Southern, Southern Africa in general. Um, uh, but we haven't yet made specific direct investments in Nigeria. But during my visit, I've been meeting with several private equity funds and I'm learning the landscape. So the goal is to find private equity fund managers who have values that align with ours, who have a mission that aligns with ours. What would they, how would they position, or how would a business be positioned to take advantage of your mm. investment. So the, um, the typical situation that comes before us is a private equity fund okay. that has developed a strategy of allocating its capital into businesses that are addressing social problems and have figured out business models that can generate income. 
and be profitable over a period of time. So for us, um, we are looking for private equity ex experts who are very good at finding great businesses and great managers and allocating their capital and helping those managers uh, help their businesses achieve the full potential. But the private equity investors you look, you're talking with, are they local based private equity investors or they can come from anywhere? Great question. Ray should say more. I'll, I'll just give you two cents on this and that is um, we're always most eager to find and to back the locally based, the rooted in, in the region, attentive to the, the region's needs. The reality has been, especially for Nigeria, and we see the, the analysis um, underscores this, there have not been that many investable impact funds, uh, private equity funds, uh, to date. Are there specific, uh, specific amounts you are looking at investing? Is there a maximum? Is there a uh, uh, that's the private equity guys you're supporting are going to invest in a particular business? Is there a maximum amount? Is there a minimum amount? And why are you looking at? We will invest amounts that are appropriate for the size of the private equity fund within practical boundaries. So if you take a billion dollars over 10 years, it's roughly 100 million a year. Um, and you think about how many funds you might be able to invest in, well, we will invest one amount of capital in a billion dollar fund and a different amount of capital in a 50 million dollar fund. So it will be sized in a way that is appropriate to the size of the fund and appropriate for the amount of capital we have.